Good morning. The committee on parole is called back to order. The time is 11.30. Our next case is Mr. Eugene Minor. Mr. Minor, would you please give us your full name and DOC number? Eugene Renee Minor, DOC 605178. Thank you, Mr. Minor. Mr. Minor, let me explain our process to you. First, I'm going to read some information into the record. And then the board is going to conduct a parole interview with you. At the appropriate time, we will allow the participants who've indicated willingness to speak have their input. At the end of that uh, process, you can make a brief statement before the board. Those persons uh, who are here today with us that wish to speak are uh, on Zoom. Uh, your great aunt in support is Carol Emery, your brother Julius Sanchez, and your godmother Dale Pierre. Uh, speaking in opposition are Miss. Uh, Genesis Sterling, Joan Minor, and Andre, uh, no, I'm sorry, just present. Uh, no one's speaking, but they are present here in the uh, our facility here at headquarters. Uh, do you understand our process, sir? Yes, sir. This is uh, Eugene Minor, DOC number 605-178, a date of birth. February the 27th of 1988. He's a second class offender. He has a parole eligibility date of October the 4th of 2022. Uh, he is not eligible for good time. He has a full term date of October the 4th of 2027. He is currently serving a 10 year sentence on the charge of indecent behavior with a juvenile. Uh, Mr. Uh, Minor, is that information all appear to be accurate? Yes, sir. Mr. Minor, uh, your case has been assigned to Ms. Pearl Wise. She will begin our interview process. Would you please answer any questions she might have? Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. How's it going? I'm good, thank you. Good, good. Uh, is this your first parole here? Yes, ma'am, it is. Oh, okay, good, good. But well, call up for the record how long you've been in jail on this chart. It'll be uh, five years, uh, approximately six years, and uh, the coming October 4th of this year. And October will be six years old, all right, uh, five years. And how old are you today? 35. 35. How much education do you have? Uh, I, did com I did complete my um, high set uh, diploma in 2020, December of 2020. But the last actual grade that I completed was the um I was the seventh grade. I was in the eighth grade, but I hadn't completed uh the eighth grade. I I in a class that I've gotten my um highest set diploma. Very good. I, I had that at the top of my sheet. Yeah, December the eighth of 2020. You got your highest set. Congratulations. They don't give those away. So I know you worked hard. Okay. Uh, do you have a trade? Are you working toward a trade? Uh, I have um, enrolled in Ashland University. Okay. Um, uh, the application is still open only due to the fact that uh, there has been some type of hold on um, the Pell second chance Pell Grant, uh, but uh, I do have a trade that I have accumulated and still framing while I was outside in society in um, 2007 or 2008 and still framing. And I've worked at multiple of jobs um, dealing with steel as a whole. But um, as far as furthering my education, I'm, I'm still awaiting either Ashland or to get in some other type of uh, recreational uh, and job experience uh, program. Okay. Have you decided what you would major in if you got accepted into Ashland? Uh, yes, ma'am. I, I will be going for um, my associates in business uh, management. Okay. Uh, uh, it, uh, it, a couple of the curriculums would include uh, world religion, uh, financial, as well as um, uh, you know either uh, sociology, psychology, or um, good, good. Actually, actually. Yes, yes, that's that sounds really good. That. Uh, you do have a, a pending charges from 2018 in Orleans Parish that they do have a detainer on you. Are you aware of that? Um, when my um lawyer, whom I had in no, representing, no, no, correct. they don't have a detainer, but there's an outstanding warrant, and that's what they don't have a detainer. So, what you show a warrant, there's no detainer on, right? Right, ma'am. 
Okay, yeah, they don't detain them, but, but they do have a warrant for you from 2018. Are you aware of those open charges? I'm not. Yeah, uh, they, uh, it's, it's quite a few charges. It seems like it was a uh, domestic violence incident where you got six charges on April the 22nd of 2017. Oh, uh, you, you, you went wild that day. I've been incarcerated since October 4, 2017, ma'am. Well, I don't know that date of 4, 27, 22 or 27 is when the charge was, a, was alleged, was lodged, or when it was committed. I don't know. But on the rap sheet, it, it's showing that's the date that you was charged with. I don't know when the incident occurred. Okay. But they, they do have an open bond. bond uh, if you got any family, you can ask them to go look at it and we'll find out what's going on with it. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, you in your in your criminal history, you had a court to the juvenile charge back in two thousand and six. What was that about? Uh, I had uh, encountered a young lady whom I had met in New Orleans, Louisiana, when I was located at a residence in um, um, New Orleans East. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was misled on what well, my entire family was misled on the actual age of this individual in which we later found out that she had been a runaway from, I believe, Covington, Georgia. Um, and, and which, uh, when it was, you know, uh, brought to our attention, I, I was turned into the precinct to, you know, uh, deal with that accordingly. So with the cause of your juvenile, what was the cruelty? And you, I think look, what I'm looking at, you got 24 days in the parish jail. That's what, that's what you said, and pertaining to the misdemeanor carnal knowledge of a juvenile. The, okay, now you had a carnal knowledge of a juvenile, that was in 2017. So uh, I'm talking about the 2006 incident. I was going to ask you about the 2017 next. The misdemeanor carnal knowledge of a juvenile. You don't recall, though? I've, I've only, uh, the only in 2006, man. Mm -hmm. Unless I misrode it, yeah, that's what I'm showing. Yeah. But that's, 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 I'm sorry, that, that, that could have, cruelty to a juvenile, that could have been an incident. I, I'm, 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 not, I'm not for certain, but because I okay. can't even, I so remember in 2000. That's what, that's what the, uh, the information I have shows, that was the outcome of, of the, who is it to a juvenile charge? You got 24 days in the parish jail. Okay, no, no, no. that's okay. I was just curious because uh, you know it, it says I like to, uh, I like to kind of look at history and uh, and how did you get here? You know, how did you get to indecent behavior with a juvenile? Oh, okay. Excuse me, I apologize. I do recall that incident in which I got into a fight with a um with a uh the guy out uh, of 2006 I, I which was a year after Katrina I had to be just making 17 years old and in uh -huh. a, a trailer park um Myrtle Grove trailer park mm -hmm. in which in which I had gotten into a fight with a guy who was approximately the age of 15 or 16 years old it was um uh it was a it was a verbal domestic uh, the verbal a verbal altercation that ended up getting physical in which the police had gotten called in that, in that, um, yeah, yes, you get 24 days in the past year. And so the yes. 2017 must be when the girl was a runaway and then you didn't know she was a minor. That I guess. was in 2017. Oh, that wasn't 2017, ma'am. That was 2000. And I'm, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 13, it was, it, was, it was charged as felony carnal knowledge of a juvenile, but then was amended to misdemeanor carnal knowledge of a juvenile. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was the record show. But I was trying to figure out uh, what happened in that incident. I, that's what I'm asking you about. I have that in the record. Talking about the one that I'm incarcerated for today, ma'am? Or that's the okay. one? That's okay, that's okay, that's okay. I'm, I'm gonna I'm change my line of, line of question. What was your relationship to the victim that you were incarcerated for now? That's my, uh, that's my niece. That is my biological brother's um, daughter. Okay, right. Uh, speak to that now. Now that you've, you've been down for five years, what have you come to the conclusion about this? 
I come you have to say anything to her. What would you say? I that my actions were not justifiable. That my words wouldn't be able to express the remorse that I have to extend to that person. That that person did nothing wrong, uh, deserving of my foolish actions. That that I that I depicted. That it wasn't her fault. That you know that. I mean, I've just, I've just come, you know, I've come, I've, I've done a lot to try to, 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 to atone, uh, to try to just for future references to not end up having to inflict this much pain on any other individual because no one is deserving of that. Um, my, 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 you know, um, I, 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 with, with, with the deepest sincerity, I mean, I, I, I could, I can't take back what I did, you know. And I would just hope that it not have caused as detrimental of a problem as a, a psychological, psychological wise, because it's, it, it, there is a ripple effect, and you know, there is, um, it, it, my, my actions didn't just hurt the victim, the victim's family, the victims, um, the, the, the community. The, the the media, just the integrity, the integrity wise, um, you know, the, there's a there's a psychological strain and, and an emotional uh, pain that was caused that that's been started, and I myself, you know, I, I, knowing knowing that uh, the effect that that could have on a person, uh, you know, because it's not about me, and that's that's, that's where I'm at with this, just. With okay, that was uh, that was my way of asking you. I saw you took the victim impact class. You finished that on June the 26th of 23. You just finished that. So I guess yes. your answer there was what you learned in that victim impact class. Also, I had learned uh, multiple of things dealing with victims. I took the entire full-phase SOTP program, which stands for the acronym for Sex Offender Therapy Program. Mm -hmm. And I received all four of those phases. Um, prior to also getting into the victim's impact course in 2023. And I've learned that, you know, um, it's just for every, for every choice, every single choice that we make in life has a reaction, it has an effect, and it doesn't just stop with the initial person or, 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 or whatever that the crime that is being committed, it doesn't just impact one individual there's a system there's a web that is created uh at you know that 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 extends and it causes it it, it, it impacts more lives than we stop you there I, I get I, I get the picture I'm going to stop you there um uh, <clears throat> I want to talk about your your uh your write-ups you had three write-ups in 2022 you have one in 2021 and one in 2020 uh that's concerning for me and one of your write-ups, uh, 6-8 of 2022, was because you were talking loud. Just talking loud. And when the officer asked you to stop talking. Explain that to me. Uh, there's, again, I'm, I'm, I won't sit here and I won't make excuses for my actions. I take full responsibility for them. Um, but it, being that you asked to, for me to explain it to you, uh, they had just had some um, new rollings on a uh, transitional unit on N1, which is a step away from actually getting back onto the compound mm -hmm. and um, compound of the unit, general population, have you. Um, and there was loud noises being made, and the officer um, had said the next person to make any noise would be uh, written up. He didn't care who it was. And actually the noise that I was making was me just trying to get his attention for him to come to my cell, which I was calling for the guard. But, you know, with all of the extra confusion going on, he kind of just was like, I right, just kind of being disrespectful. But my intent was to actually get this officer to come and see what I want. And I actually said, it's Eugene Minor cell, such and such, that's trying to speak to you. But I mean, I, I can understand the frustration and the confusion. And, why he ended up writing me up for that. But he had just said what he said. He he did and pertaining to the and, and except and um yes ma'am he did. Okay, okay. 
Um, if you're successful today, where would you live and how would you support yourself? I have um <clears throat> I have um plans to get out and um I, there's a residence provided for me um uh from my great aunt who has a uh, property. She has a uh, you know, she's really been my support system um, for for as long as I can remember for all my life, really. And um, my dad has a uh, landscaping company in which he, I believe, had just been found to have dementia in which I wouldn't have a problem in going out and um, taking over those customers. Being I used to go to work with him all the time growing up with him. And uh, also, I will, will be in the market to look for uh, another part-time job as well. And I did have plans on going and enrolling in uh, a community college in the area to try to still further my education uh, uh, even more so. I, I, I just want to say this for the record. I saw that you participated in the spelling bee in 2019. I, I hadn't yes. seen that. Uh, and that was new to me. It's great. That's great. I don't know how you out, how you came out, but you did participate. Uh, I that was Go ahead. It was only it was uh, it was down to me and one other guy, and uh, my word was initiative. And being that I was just so pressured behind um, spelling it so quickly, I spelled it uh, with an A instead of an I, instead oh. of N I, instead of N I, N I I N I T I T B E. I spelled it I N I T A B I. It's it's great. I I spelled it mis misspelled it by one letter. Oh yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so what is so what do you do every day now in the prison? What's your job? Uh, well, I'm a dorm orderly. I'm assigned dorm orderly. Okay. I um I'm also in reentry. The reentry program. Uh, our last week is this Tuesday coming. Um, so I, I'll be completed with that reentry program as well. Um, I've applied for the honor card in hopes to get, um, which I believe they should be holding the honor board really soon, but to try to, if hypothetically speaking, that I don't make parole, that I would be able to try to get a more um, hands on job. Have, uh, maybe prison industries or uh enemy okay. as well as still try to of course further my education or um work experience and okay. maybe a coaching program or something. <clears throat> yeah. All right, then that's that's all my questions. Uh, Warren, what can you tell us about this young man? I don't have any comments, wise. All right, thank you, sir. That concludes my interview. Thank you very much. Now we'll hear from uh, your supporters, Ms. Carol uh, Emery. Ms. Emery, if you would please give us your full name and uh, tell us what you'd like us to say about your uh, nephew. Uh, my name is Carol Lewis Emery. Um, Eugene has been in my life, like he said, from birth. Um, Eugene has lots of issues growing up. We've spent a lot of time getting him the help and services he needs. He's diagnosed with uh, Asperger and uh, uh, schizophrenia. And I know on and off there, he's been on and off his medicine. Sometimes it's hard to explain, but he's very intelligent. He was raised in a family that loves him. We supported him in everything he's done. It's, it's always been a Christian atmosphere. He know the word. He knows right from wrong. He can be impulsive. Even in school, he get into things. He's been in therapy forever, but he has a heart. It's unfortunate that what happened happened. I know he's remorseful. So we, there was a lot of things going back and forth with him and his biological mother, who is my niece, for years. And uh, I tried my best to protect him, to stay away from them because she, Honestly, never wanted to have anything to do with him. But as a kid, people want to know who their moms are. So the back and forward happened. This situation happened. I wish he had listened to me and stayed away, but he didn't. That's unfortunate. When he comes here, he has all the support he could ever need from 
this family. I, I, I actually, have, my husband and I have, um, my husband had five kids from the first marriage. I had three. So that was eight. And then we raised you, G. So there's nine. We have a huge extended family. And so there's no issue. We don't make excuses for him. Everybody's uh -huh. held accountable. I'm absolutely in the process of locating a place for him. It's going to be a mobile home or we're going to rent or we're going to do something. But he absolutely will have somewhere to stay. He absolutely will have people that's going to monitor him and make sure he do what he's supposed to do. And so we're, I have his uh, daughter who's now seven. He's given me full custody from there. And I have full custody from the courts on her mom's side. We already, we've already put things in place to make sure everybody's safe, including him. You know, we don't ever want this to ever happen again. And so I, I know coming home would benefit him. We miss him and I know he miss us. And uh, that's all I can think to say. I want you to know that he does have a real support system and he really does have a support system uh, between the church, the family and the community. People are looking for him to come home and do something positive with his life. Thank and you very continue much. Continue to do something positive with his life. Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate your comments. Yes. Now yes. we're here for Mr. Julius Sanchez. Good morning. I'm Julius Sanchez. I'm uh, I'm Eugene's brother and uh, probably his biggest supporter. Uh, I was the always the one that tried to keep him in line, and I would advocate for him and. My mom was telling me he made bad decisions. I just thought it was in his mind. But one day I really realized the the, um, the Asperger's thing. It, it's, it's, it's failure to make good decisions. So from that point on, I would try to help him to make good decisions and stay on them, right? Unfortunately, when this incident happened, I had been I moved to Oklahoma for some studies, and I wasn't around when this incident happened. And, it's very unfortunate that it happened. Uh, I don't know all the details, but I know maybe I shouldn't say this, but honestly, I don't, uh, it's hard for me to believe that for me. And I don't know, he, he's confessing, he said this part, but it's hard for me to believe that he would even do that, you know? And uh, I know some of the other incidents that he spoke to y'all, but in the past, it, it was just him making bad decisions and not thinking things out, which I think was a direct, result of his Asperger's, you know, um, diagnosis, but he's here and, and look, if my mom is going to have a place, but I have a house with two bedrooms. Um, so I'm going to make sure he has somewhere to stay and all the support that he needs, um, especially emotionally and spiritually. And, 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 and he, I know you won't have the opportunity to talk to Eugene in depth, but he's a very spiritual person. You know, he's, he's a very intelligent person, right? So, I think he just made some bad decisions in life, which we all did. Believe me, I made some in my life, you know, and I know there's atonement and uh, there's redemption and, and what he knows in, in Jesus Christ. So we, we're ready. We're ready for him to come home and we, we're here to support him. Thank you very much, uh, St. Chad. We appreciate your comments. Uh, Dale Pierre. Yes, I'm Dale Pierre. I'm his godmother. And I've been in Eugene's life since he was 10 months old and came out the hospital. I've gone with his aunt to pick him up several times, many, many times. I know him. He's been in and out my house, him and my son, who is the same age as he is, 35. They are like brothers. And my son um, works a job where he can get him hard with him as a security officer. So he would have a job. That wouldn't be an issue. And like Julius and Carol both said, Eugene would have somewhere to stay. And if all else fails, he can, well, I have a full bedroom house. He's welcome to stay in. Um, Eugene is a good kid. I've known him, like I said, all of his life. I know him. I'm a mental health social worker. I also work with clients who have schizophrenia. And Eugene, when he's off his meds, is when he's his worst enemy. And so I'm believing that when he's consistent, I know he does the right thing. He make wise choices, but he's impulsive, like Carol says, and he does make unwise choices at that time. But as long as he takes his meds, Eugene is 
good. He, he follows through the things he says. He's a sweetheart. And I know it's, I love him. So I guess it's easy for me to say those things, but it's facts. And we're all Christians. Eugene know the word. He's been raised in church all of his life. And so we're looking forward to him coming back home and being a productive citizen in the community. Thank you very much, and we appreciate your comments. Uh, Mr. Meyer, is there anything you'd like to say to the board before uh, the board votes? I just want to say that uh, again, how deeply remorseful I am for my actions. And that I can assure that, especially being on this side of the wall, and having seen what I've seen and been forced to be away from people who actually love and want to see and me do good for myself as well as for for mankind. I, mean, I just can assure that I, 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 I'm not trying to live this. This is not for me. And I'm, I'll do by all means anything necessary and go above and beyond to the best of my ability to do better, to where this doesn't have to happen to anybody else, as well as me having to ever having to end up in a institution like this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miter. Panel ready to vote? Yes. Mr. Yes. Um, Eugene, I uh, as, as your family has said, you are you know you're a highly intelligent young man. Uh, you have to work a little harder, you know, and 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 with your connection with your brains and your actions, you have to work a little harder with that Asperger's. And then did everyone else have to? So I want you to hear from me. I'm just one vote, just not today. For me, my vote is uh, I would like to see a longer period right up for you. Demonstrate that you can control yourself. Uh, and, and the age of the victim and the impact of the crime on the victim is, is uh, disturbing for me. Also, you have a high needs, and your needs, you have a high mm -hmm. anti social thinking and, and your mental health. So that, those are areas that. You got the support that you need. You're just not embracing the support. You have a beautiful family. I really appreciate them here today uh, supporting you. But you stop getting right up. You start doing what they say on the other side. For me, my vote is, again, not today. I want you to hear, not today. That's my vote, Terry. Thank you, Ms. Fox. Ms. Jackson. Mr. Minor, um, I'm glad you're making some progress. I am. I'll tell you, this is from, and I've, I've seen some really difficult things. But today, my heart is broken because the victim of this case is in this hearing room, and I can see her devastation. Mm -hmm. And I felt like she's been totally left out of this whole process. Nobody cares how well you did in this building, because that trivializes just the horrid, horrific nature of what you've done to her and, and how you've destroyed her life. And to characterize your actions as mistakes or an unwise choice, this diminishes the harm that you have caused to her because those mistakes and, and unwise choices have devastated this child. And everybody seems to agree about that. She's left out of the picture altogether. And so I don't think that's that's right. I think she needs to understand that what happened to her was terrible. And that I and other people on the board recognize how devastating this has been to her and how devastating it would be to her to have your crime minimized by releasing you after you've served less than half of your sentence. I just can't do that today. I cannot. You have high uh, risk. You have a fair institutional um, record. And you had write-ups as recently as last year. So I don't think you're ready. And I think to release you would just minimize the impact that your crime has had on this world and will continue to have on her 
And I just hope that all the help that people are offering you, they would think about her because she's a member of their family too. That they would think about her and the help that she needs. So my vote today is to deny. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Mr. Minor, you received two votes to deny. My vote likewise would be to deny for the same reasons as outlined by my, my two colleagues. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we will do another hearing after this. If I can, uh, I can get it done. I am just enraged. Did you hear what Miss Jackson had said? I don't care about the spelling bee. You know, this was one of the worst interviews that we've seen. Maybe the worst for Miss Wise ever. But then to hear that the victim of this case was in the room. That's what Miss Jackson said. She said the victim of this case was in the room. She had to sit there and watch Miss Wise bumble around this hearing, congratulate him on his spelling bee, and not even bring up anything to do with the crime. And thank you, Miss Jackson, for coming in and saving it. Now she said it's important for the victim to know that we care, that the board cares. Because you you actually would have no idea what this hearing was about. You would have had none. You, you know, I had to I listened to this now, I think, three times. Because there's no records of what happened. There's nothing, no information. And finally I was able to put it together. This guy has three charges. One where it's indecent, uh, sorry, cruelty to a juvenile, which he was able to just say that he got in a fight. The guy was 16. He was like 19. So that's why they gave. And I don't believe it. I don't think you get like 26 days in jail and a cruelty to a juvenile charge for just like a street fight. Then he has another charge, which is which was a felony carnal knowledge with an underage girl who it was dropped from a felony to a misdemeanor. And he was able to just say, Oh, well it was a, uh, she was a runaway. I, I had no idea. Okay, sure. Then he has a third charge. Cruelty to a juvenile, his brother's daughter. Now, Miss Wise had no idea what was going on in this case. She wrote some notes. She couldn't understand her own notes. She did not prepare. The bottom line is she did not prepare. And then to know that the victim is sitting in the room? It's a gross injustice. It's a complete lack of... It's upsetting. Then you have his supporters come in. The brother actually states, I don't even think my brother did it. With this giant smile on his face as he's saying it. I don't even think my brother did it. Look at that face. His smile. Yeah, this is real funny. 
and you're his brother. So I don't understand it. So you're calling your other brother a liar. You're calling the victim a liar. He pled guilty to it. What you want him to get released so that he can spend time with really these enablers, these people who are blaming his autism on, on why he's is a serial child offender. It's insulting to everyone who is autistic to say that. If Miss Jackson was not on this board, we would we would really have no idea what was going on. It was just, it's an embarrassment. If you don't want to be here, Miss Wise, then don't. You obviously don't, you obviously, it's, you're, 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 you obviously, your heart is not in it. And we'll do another hearing after this. Uh, I'm picking this one because I do believe that Miss Wise and Miss uh, Jackson kind of go head to head in this hearing. And I do think that, that sh that Miss Jackson was upset at Miss Wise for this, for this really what it was it was a blunder, and it's with the victim in the room, and it makes me sick that no one is there to support the victim. She is this little girl sitting in there. No one speaks on her behalf. The assistant DA doesn't show up. No family members show up. On the contrary, you have family members show up to talk about what a great guy he is. What does that do to someone? What does that do to a little girl? How will it make them feel about the justice system? How does it make them feel during the hearing to actually have another uncle? One uncle abuses you. The other one calls you a liar. She began her criminal career... Um probation parole office in Monroe District Office Division of Parole. Her career spanned over 20 years. She served as community resource coordinator for the district and also supervised a unit of probation and parole officers. So she was a supervisor and she was I don't know what that job entail means, but community resource coordinator is that like an operations thing? She received a master's degree in criminal justice. And she's a veteran of the National Guard. I, I did not know that. I salute you. That's interesting. But, you know, unlike... It, it just doesn't seem to be... To really fit there with the... She was, you know, with the status of the other... You know, uh, Miss Jackson being a judge. Mr. Mirabella being a judge. Um... You know, Alvin Roche is interesting. He really was just run the, the library, uh, an associate professor. But, but I mean, really what that means is he's just been studious of the law his entire life. And I think he does a great job. And Pete Freeman was the head, the director of probation and parole for 35 years. So former director of probation and parole. And then he was president of the Probation and Parole Association. And he was a state representative. I mean, it's just, she might be the lowest qualified person on this board. And I think it shows. And maybe it, maybe it's not fair. You can, I, I don't know, this upset me. It really did. It, it, it can't, you came in unprepared and and it's a disservice to, to your fellow board members and it's a disservice to the victim. And at a certain point, you, you have to draw the line. I just don't understand it. Now, it's always important to be respectful, but I can v voice my opinion. And this one was quite upsetting to me, and I think it was upsetting to the board as well. I mean, even even in our line of questioning, it was like, well, what, when he started, he started to go on and say, it wasn't her fault, uh, that, that there's... The, the, the community, the integrity, the media, like he went into this ramble about um, just really it was just, what's it called? Uh, word spaghetti. And 
Um, and then at the end of it, she's like, oh, oh, oh I see. Yeah, that, that the answer is what what you learned in Victim Impact. That's that's really great. And it was like, what? What about what he said had anything to do with learning anything in Victim Impact? It was literally word spaghetti. It infuriates me. And then he, 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 the plan for him to go, which is, who was it? Is it his aunt and his godma? The aunt, but they're going to move to his house. And she says that she has eight kids and, and, and this huge extended family. And it's like, really? You're going to put someone who's twice convicted or twice prosecuted, charged with carnal knowledge of a juvenile. One becomes a misdemeanor. The other's a felony. It's his own niece. We don't even know how old she was. We have no information because Miss Wise just... None of that was important. But you think it's a good idea to then put him in a home with ex tons of other kids? And then he mentioned something about a seven-year-old daughter. Was it his daughter or someone else's daughter? I, I don't know, but if it's someone else's daughter, it's like, are you kidding me? And um, and then the cherry on the cake is his his brother comes laughing and actually states that he doesn't think his brother did it. These are the people he's going to be released to. It's uh, it's just horrible. It's terrible. Um. You know, Miss Jackson said, what did she say? She said, this this just breaks my heart. This case breaks my heart, and it breaks my heart to think that this... <sighs> you know, but now he's got... Uh, I, think, I think he has to wait five more years before he can reapply, and it's scary to think what will happen when he gets out. No, it's just, in my opinion, it's just a matter of time. It really is. Like the the, the it, it was his niece. This is not. Are you kidding me? I mean, it's like you just want to. It's just crazy. It's so crazy. But okay, this is another interesting case. So buckle up. Committee on parole is called back to order. The time is uh, 9 12 on July the uh, 12th of 11, 11th of 2023. Uh, today's panel members are Ms. Bonnie Jackson, Ms. Pearl Wise. My name is Tony Marabella, and I will be acting as chair. Our uh, remote location this morning is uh, Bozier uh, Correctional Center. Uh, Mr. Uh, Carter, is there anyone there from uh, Bozier? Uh, staff members from Bozier in the room with you today? Yes, sir. Sorry. Okay. Would, would the staff please introduce themselves? I'm sorry I couldn't see you. Sergeant Todd Roberts, security. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Carter, would you please give us your full name and DOC number? William Stephen Carter. 35 Mr. Carter, let me explain our process to you. This is a parole revocation hearing. Uh, I'm going to read to you your parole revocation questionnaire and go over it with you. Do you have that document with you? Please, uh, so. Okay. And then after we go over that, I'm going to read the allegations uh, that uh, charge you with uh, potential violations of your parole. Then we'll have a hearing. We'll have an interview with you. Uh, and after we have that interview, you'll have an opportunity to discuss this case with us and uh, we'll vote. You understand that? Yes, sir. When I read you the allegations, you'll have a right to plead either not guilty or guilty or not guilty with a statement or not or guilty with a statement. Do you understand our process? Yes, sir. Mr. Carter, uh, would you take a look at your parole revocation questionnaire? Do you see yes. that? Have that with you? 
Yes, sir. Is that your signature on the bottom of the page uh, dated May the 10th of 2023? Yes, sir. And are all of those allegations, uh, all of those answers that you made on that questionnaire on May the 10th of 2023 still correct today? Yes, sir. Do you have an attorney representing you, Mr. Carter? No, sir. Do you wish to proceed today without an attorney? Yes, sir. Carter, I'm now going to read the allegations against you. Uh, it's alleged that you have violated rule number four on September the 3rd of 2022. You committed a new felony offense of domestic abuse battery. Through a plea agreement, you pled guilty to the misdemeanor offense of criminal mischief on April the 17th of 2023. Uh, how do you plead to those allegations? Uh, I didn't commit a felony. Uh, I was charged with one. Uh, the, the reason uh, I pled guilty to uh, the uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me slow you down, Mr. Mr. Carter. Sometimes these allegations are written in such a way that it's very difficult simply to say guilty or not guilty, okay? It's my understanding that, uh, if I might interject, uh, you, you wish to make a statement about what it was. You were charged with a felony. You pled guilty to a misdemeanor. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you'd like to make a statement as to why you pled guilty to the misdemeanor and you weren't charged with the felon. Is that fair to say? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, your case has been assigned to Ms. Bonnie Jackson. Would you answer any questions that she might have? Good morning, Mr. Will Mr. Carter. How long have you been uh, detained on this charge? How long have all the... the on the, on the parole home. How long have you been in jail on a parole home? Oh, since September 3rd. Of last year. Now, 2022. All right. And you were living in Lake Charles, is that correct? No, ma'am. I was staying in Houghton. Okay. Uh, where did the incident happen? In Houghton? Yes, ma'am. At my home. Okay. Uh, were up until the date of this incident, were you in compliance with the conditions of your parole? No. Were you working? Uh, I I run a uh, sober living home. You were in a so say that again. I I'm owner operator of a sober living home. So that means the answer to the question is that you were working. Yes. Yes. And you were paying your fee. Um, up to the date, you know, ma'am, I was, I was off due to Corona, uh, a hospital stint, but I was, I was, my officer knew what was going on. Okay, so you were keeping in touch with your, your parole officer? Yes, ma'am. When were you in the hospital and for how long? Um, I had a, um, bacteria in my blood. And my blood pressure went up to 230 over 170, and my temperature was 103.7 for a week and a half. And okay. around this how time, long, how long were you in the hospital? Uh, two weeks. Okay. I take my Go ahead. I so take this, my let's uh, talk about the incident now. Uh, I think um, most of the facts are not in dispute. You were at your home with your current uh, girlfriend, former girlfriend came to your house, a little bit upset with you because you were with your new girlfriend, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And how did she gain entry into your home? She um, opened the door and walked in. It wasn't locked. So, no. so I mean, did she did she knock on the door and you come to the door, or did she just walk in the house? She, she walked in the house all the time. Well, what did she do on this day? 
Walked in the house. And then what happened when she walked in the house? Uh, but she, it didn't start out as her being a, a belligerent. It started out as her just coming over, hey, how you doing? You know, she stayed in Shreveport. I stayed in Houghton. Uh, she came over. She's come in. We're talking. My sober living home is for uh, women and children. So it wasn't nothing big about a girl being there, but then I established that one of the females that was there was my girlfriend. That's when she became a litter. Okay. And what happened when she became belligerent? Uh, I asked her to leave. I asked her to leave a bunch of times. Then I called the police and I told them, I, my 911 call, I said, gave him my name. I said, hey, I'm not trying to have anybody get in trouble. I don't want her to go to jail. I don't want to go to jail. Could y'all please get her out of my house? Okay. And what happened? Why are you in jail then? <laughs> Because they came out um, after I made the call, I waited. It took the um, from the time I made the 911 call to the time that I actually escorted her out of my house. It was like 20 minutes of her going through my house. She was she squirted uh, toiletries on my in my carpet. She broke dishes and she grabbed my coffee table picked it up and threw it. When she threw it, I grabbed her. Took how three steps. Grab, describe how you grabbed her. Oh, I just grabbed her around her waist. Took okay. three steps to the door and she was out the door. The whole thing, the whole incident was over. There was, I, I had no intent of harming her or nothing. I asked her to leave several times. I called the police. Um, I mean, it was like 40 minutes before the police answered my 911 call. Okay. At least 40. Well, um, she indicated, I mean, the, the deputy indicated that he saw redness on Miss Brie Love's neck, a small cut on her nose, and a red mark on her forehead. There, there's, there's no red mark on her neck. They took pictures. There was a cut, a uh, cut. Uh, uh, right here on her forehead and one on her ear where she was fighting against me once she was outside to get back into my house. Her. She's and like she's like five two, I'm five nine, and when she ran up against me, all I did was hold my hands out and that's where her glasses got pushed up over her face. Well, on May 18th, uh, she, um, reported to the DA's office said, and she acknowledged that she had come to your home, got upset because there was another female there. She picked up a glass coffee table, threw the table down and broke it, and then grabbed her from behind and began to pick me up to remove me from the residence. She stated she began to fight back against Carter because she didn't want to be removed while being dragged out by Mr. Carter. Miss Street Love sustained some minor cuts and scrapes. And then she said you would never hurt her. You were not trying to hurt her. Uh, I was just not wanting to be removed from the residence. Uh, so I was fighting so he couldn't remove me. That sound about accurate? Yes, ma'am. Can I ask you a question? Uh, was the female um, that, uh, in the house with you, was she a resident of your sober living home? No, no. The, um, on the, the, the thing, the resident that was there was uh, Elizabeth Hall. They named Elizabeth Hall as my girlfriend on the uh, paper that you're, I believe you're reading. Well, actually, no, actually, they they named her as Shelly Dance. That's that. She she wasn't a resident of the home. She was just my girlfriend. I just wanted to make sure because it's certainly not good practice to date somebody who's a resident in your sober living facility. I know, I know. 
She, she wasn't a resident of the sober living mom now. And how did you become involved? How did you start a sober living business? Um, as you know, my uh, charge is distribution of methamphetamines. I went and did 11 years. I came home. It was a rocky start when I got, got out. Uh, Christopher Chad Johnson is a guy that he's into the sobriety. I was helping him out with his situation of uh, remodeling houses. And the home that I actually had was gifted to me by Chris. And he said I could have the trailer. I had to maintain a sober living home. And at which time that the lot that it was on needed the trailer, another, a new trailer to go there. I had to move it and maintain it as a sober living home in another trailer park. And the trailer was mine. And how long had you been doing it? How long had you operating a sober living home? Three, three months. Well, during your incarceration, what's become of the, the facility? Um, when I called the police and I had them try, well, I asked them to remove the female from my house. They left people at my house, and my house was ransacked. Uh, a lot of stuff was stolen. The house is still there. I don't know exactly what Mr. Johnson is gonna say or do because he he called my pro officer. He he spoke up on my behalf with this this situation, but I think he's upset about how some of the how I got locked up and why I got locked up and stuff like that. So he, I'm, I'm in the sober living. That's what I'm going to be doing for him. But I don't know about that at 810 uh, Timbers East. So I guess my question is, are you going to have housing and employment uh, when you're released? Ma'am? Are you going to have housing and employment if you're released? Oh yes, ma'am. I, I I will. I'm I'm still working for uh, Mr. Johnson. Okay. All right. That's all I have. I have one question. Yes, ma'am. Now, as you as you sit back and look at this situation, what could you have done differently and gotten a different outcome? What have you come up with? Um, it's really hard to say because. When 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 I approach this situation, I try to do whatever I, what I thought everybody would say. They say you should have called the police. I called the police. Um, one deputy told me that I should have walked away. I did for 20 minutes. She was in my house tearing my stuff up. When she picked the coffee table up and threw it, I I, I knew but nobody gonna replace none of my stuff. I wasn't trying to hurt her. I wasn't trying to have her throw something through my television or bust any windows out. All I did was I wrapped her up. I, I got you. So, uh, so you, you did get some new information. The officer suggested that you should have walked away because the stuff can be replaced eventually. I, 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 it hard, the stuff can be replaced. But when the police rolled up, she would have been in the house doing all she was doing. You just been standing outside. And then the case would have been made it set. Uh, I just want to put that on your mind. That, that what that officer said was what I was thinking as well. Just, just let her tear it all up because it's stuff. Stuff can be replaced. But your time, the momentum that you had in your ministry, all of that has been, you know, all of that's been moved back. Yes, ma'am. When you could have bought a new tablecloth, you could have bought a new coffee table eventually. Could clean up the glass and you did all that. Would have been hard, but you wouldn't have been in jail. Listen, think about what that officer said. Yes, ma'am. That's what she said. So I just wanted to hear you, hear your side. That's all I had, Jim. Thank you. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say before the board votes, Mr. Uh, Carter? 
Um, I don't, the, the victim tried to zoom in. I, I, I think, I don't know if she's there. If y'all have talked to her. We don't, we don't show anything. Did, uh, well, we have her statement that she made on May 18th. And I'm, that I read, and I'm sure that would be the gist of what she has to say today. So, uh, yeah, um, information. When when I when I went to the court on May the 18th, I think it was no April April 17th, and I the um, Judge Petard asked me. He said, uh, "Would you?" Um, Take a criminal mischief today. I told him no because it was a. Um, it started out as a, uh, a domestic, and my pro officer told me that I couldn't take no charge. Uh, Judge Petard had already spoken with Mr. Breedlove, and he told me that at the time he said uh, the reason I'm giving you the criminal mischief. Is it's a misdemeanor without a victim, it wouldn't violate your parole. When he told me this, I looked at my lawyer. My lawyer said, Okay, he's correct. Um, um, the deputy vote talk Kirkhart, Kirkhart for the Bowdoin Parish uh, Sheriff's Department over in the max when I went to court, he said. Now, it won't violate your parole. I didn't understand what was going on because I thought I was going on. The judge told me that if I got that, that there was no process, all the charges, and I was going home that day. That was in April. I didn't, I didn't cop out just to cop out because my, uh, my trial date would have been next week. Had I known that this was going to be July before I even got heard on this. I would have taken it to trial because I, in my mind, I don't think I did anything to serve 10 months because although I did not walk away, I thought I did everything that I was supposed to do in that situation to keep me and Miss Bree Love out of jail. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Uh, I'm worried about okay. uh, Mr. Carter, I do think you did everything you could have done in that situation. And unlike uh, Ms. Wise, I don't know that I would have let somebody break up all my stuff either. You know, uh, it's unfortunate that you found yourself in this situation. It's even more unfortunate that you were held in jail for 10 months or something like this. My vote is to do not revoke and return you to supervision. And I hope you can pick up pieces and move forward. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Mr. Ms. Wise. Uh, Mr. Carter, as an individual on parole, your goal should always be to not have your name on the police report. In any scenario that you walk into, that's your goal. How can I not have my name on a police report because of what's happening? Keep that in the forefront of your mind. Because, you know, uh, I concur my vote is to do not revoke as well, continue your supervision with the added condition that you enroll in general counseling for a period of time that being appropriate by that provider. If it's a parole officer, you should be able to find something on a uh, sliding face. As you pour out to people, you need to be poured into. So you need, you need a counselor. Best wishes to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Ms. Wise. Mr. Uh, Mr. Carter, uh, I, I agree with both of my colleagues. Uh, Ms. Jackson and I were both criminal defense lawyers and judges. Uh, Ms. Wise is a probation officer. Uh, and, and there's wisdom in what both of them have said to you. Uh, and, and that is, uh, I do agree. That probably did everything that you could do under those circumstances. That was very reasonable the way you acted. But the reality is you are on parole and there's a cloud over your head. And uh, 
even though you don't still have many rights, you're still under suspicion. Unfortunately for you, because you were on parole, you found yourself in jail for 10 years. I mean, for 10 months. Uh, had you not been on parole, you might not be there. So it, it's, uh, I want you to heed Ms. Wise's words because it, it's important. Because, uh, you know, you may be scrutinized more strictly than someone who's not on it. So that's good advice to you. Okay. Uh, I think you did everything you should do. Uh, I believe you when you say your lawyer and the judge told you that. Uh, unfortunately, that's not how parole works. The parole board is who, de is who decides whether or not you were revoked or not. Uh, probation is up to the judge, but not parole. Uh, so I, I do believe that, uh, you know, had you had it all to do over again, you probably would have gone to trial. And my guess is you probably would have been acquitted. But uh, I agree with my colleagues. My vote is also do not vote. So good luck to you, sir. Thank you. And he steps out to freedom. If you could imagine 10 months that he had to spend locked up, we'll do another hearing after this. It's another parole revocation hearing. He's got an attorney. It's quite an interesting hearing. Well, did you see that? Um, it looked to me like uh, Miss Jackson and Miss Wise were kind of butting heads there a little bit, and I think it's great and healthy that they would do that and, and share their different opinions. And then uh, it looked like Mr. Marabella kind of got in the middle and tried to, uh, mm, I don't know what the word would be, but tried to uh, manage that scenario where they're kind of butting heads. I, on one side, I do hear what Miss Wise is saying, right? Like, you just have to, you know, she's basically saying you have to let that crazy lady be inside your house and rip it apart. And you just have to do it because your freedom's on the line and um, sucks for you. And Miss Jackson was saying, you know what? I, I, I don't, I wouldn't have let anyone do that. And, uh, you know, first it was the coffee table and then maybe next would have been the TV and then everything else. Um, and it's real easy for Miss Wise to say, you can replace that stuff, but how? <laughs> I mean, you know, he, he has his boss he has to report to, his boss furnished the place, not him. He's going to say, what, so your girlfriend came and wrecked all my stuff? And then, you know, it must have been just terrifying, terrifying. He has on one hand, he has this woman in his place who's just wrecking everything. He's probably thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm going to lose my job. And not to mention how embarrassing it is. You know, you have your clients there and you have your and then the police show up. They cuff him because, of course, they do. And then 10 months later, he has to wait for a revocation hearing. And he should have just gone to trial. Like Mr. Marabella, a judge said, he, he should have just gone to trial. And can you believe it? The judge gives misinformation and his own attorney gives misinformation. Basically saying, oh, you could, you could plead to it and don't worry. And it's like, how can you, as a lawyer, you just cost your client 10 months of their life. Know the law. The judge to know the law. There's so so much of the system failed this man. He he gets cuffed. I don't know how the police saw that. They would have seen a wrecked home, but they probably just listened to a couple of people yelling and screaming. They cuffed him. They threw him in jail. All of a sudden, he's revoked. Ten months later, 
and he, you know, he did say he went outside for 20 minutes. He went back in. Now the question is, you know, I don't know. If we're going to dive into things that we just don't know about. Did he go back in and that fired her more? And then she broke the coffee table. Should he have just stayed out? Would she not have broke? I don't know. Get someone else in there? I, I don't know. But it does seem to me that he, that the system did not do this man justice. He initially got this 10-year sentence or 11-year sentence for, for dealing meth. And he gets out. He seems to be trying to be doing everything the, the right way. And then uh, this crazy uh, ex-girlfriend who's not happy that he's with someone else. Maybe she was his girlfriend and she was caught cheating. I don't know. But it, she, in my opinion, she should be locked up. It's just crazy. A broken system. But which side are you on? Are you on the Miss Y side or the Miss Jackson side in this? Uh, it's an interesting one. I think as much as I, as much as I've been giving Miss Wise a really hard time, she might be right. I mean, what is you know, it, it it's it's unfortunate, but you don't want to you don't want to. Um, you just have to lose all your stuff and maybe your job because you're under the microscope and and picking beer hugging her and getting her out of there um it all she has to do is say he hurt me which is what happened and you get locked up and what do you think she's gonna do when the police come say that so but um anyways love to hear your thoughts in the chat and in the comment section on that, but we'll go do do that one more hearing. It's another revocation hearing, and again, an interesting one. The the uh, he's got an attorney, and the board doesn't seem to be super fans of the attorney. Okay, here we go. But I'll leave it at that. What? Uh, he has a copy of his own. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. And uh, when you answered those questions on March 28th of 2023, were they, they all accurate and correct? Yes, sir. And are they still accurate and correct today? Yes, sir. And you are, in fact, represented by Mr. Lubin. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And are you ready to proceed with this hearing? Yes, sir. All right. I'm going to read you the allegations against you, and I'm going to ask you to. Uh, Enter a plea of either guilty, not guilty, guilty with a statement, and not guilty with a statement. Mr. Lubin, uh, you may uh, advise him as I go through these. Uh, number four, you were arrested on March the 23rd of 2023 by the New Orleans Police Department and charged with simple battery, domestic violence battery, violation of protective order, two counts, and simple criminal damage to property. Uh, how do you plead to that, sir? Not good. All right. Those charges were not accepted. On number 10, you have failed to make a single payment towards your supervision fees and currently are $693 in arrears. How do you plead to that, sir? Uh, good. All right. Mr. Uh, Allen, uh, your case has been assigned to uh, Ms. Pearl Wise. Would you please answer any questions she might have? Yes, Good morning. Good morning. You pled not guilty to the incident with your mother. So what did you do? Um, like I really like only thing I did was like like keep the door to zip. But for us, the other stuff, no, she just got mad, mad, mad to what you know. Like you know what I mean, and just start saying stuff like you know what I mean. Then when you said you kicked the door, did you kick the door on the way in or did you kick the door on the way out? Yeah. Yeah, what? On the way out. Okay. Now, th there was a protective order in place on December the 5th of 2022. It was a non-expiring uh, protective order. You were not to be at your mother's house. But my sister, my sister, man, my sister got it too. Yeah. And as I, as I, all the pieces, I was like, good. 
I, I know what I'm saying. Man, my sister got a tub, and that was the only that was the place I could go. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about that just for a minute since you brought it up. You and your sister got into it. And uh, there's indication in the record that you started using cocaine, and that's why your sister put you out of her house. No, I don't do no cocaine. That's oh, okay. Crack. No joke. No joke. You didn't crack Huh? Oh, I, never, I never do no crack. Oh, okay. So, so uh, why did she put you out? Cause I was, I was doing. I like. I, I ain't gonna lie. Like other drugs. You know what I mean? Oh, okay, okay. Other drugs. Like, like other drugs. You know what I mean? Okay. Like, okay. I wasn't supposed to do that. You know what I mean? So, yeah. You, you, I'm so glad to hear you say that. I was not supposed to do that. Right. And then there was some indicate you you pled guilty to uh, not paying your fees, but you indicate your sister was supposed to pay it. What is that about? Part of that, when I when I I wasn't supposed to be outside, and once I came home, I really, you know what I mean? Like really, really went down the wrong path to where I, ain't, I you know what I mean? She probably was, you know, I went there to so she could keep up, be like, well, I gotta do this, do this, do this. I went up. You know? Oh, okay. You didn't do your part. Huh? She was trying to do her part, but you didn't do your part. I didn't do my part. Yeah, and that's, that's just be honest. So what do you need? What what do you need to get your life on the right path? Like, I know what to do now, you know what I mean? I know not to be to, like, I've been gone so long to where I was closed in so much to where I don't think they understand, like, you know what I mean? I don't know. Like, to where now I know what to do, like, you know what I mean? I know what I was supposed to do, you know what I mean? Okay, all right. I just messed up. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Going outside, you know what I'm saying? Like, right. I don't, like I don't even know how to say it. Like I'm trying to say it, but I don't really know how to say it. Like, 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 you know, I mean? like, you know, around the wrong stuff. Like, you know, I mean? to well, she probably on some like, well, ooh, I ain't gonna do this. I ain't gonna do that. You know I, mean? I really put a stay inside, do what I gotta do. You mm -hmm. know I mean? Get a job or something. You know what I mean? And I ain't do that. You know what I, mean? I just did the wrong thing. You know what I mean? But I know what to do now. You know? And do you understand now that perhaps she wanted you to stay inside because of the influences in the area? She knew there was drugs around and somebody would offer it to you and then you'd be indebted to them. She, she didn't want that for you. That's what I knew. That's what I knew. That's what I knew. That's what I knew to do now. You know what I mean? Okay. Get inside and get under my teeth. You know what I mean? All right. Well, thank you for talking to me. That's all I have. Go ahead, Thanks, Jim. Mr. Allen, good morning. Good morning. Challenge. Do, do you think your mother has a right to live in peace? Yeah. Well, I, I was supposed to be. I was. I was really supposed to be by my sister, but. Yeah. But you can't. Well, but you can't get along with your sister because you don't want to do right at your sister's house. You go to your mom's house. She had to get a protective order against you, which means that you were just making her life. Almost unbearable. No, I ain't gonna say that. I probably well, that, wrong. I probably well, she wrong. got she got a restraining order. But right. I wasn't wrong in the situation. I ain't doing nothing. The only you only thing I was wrong in was going outside. You know what I mean? Well, no, yeah. you went to her house. You kicked the door in. You kicked the door in and you came into her house. All right, but I'm saying I wasn't wrong to work because I I still stayed out of trouble. I'm saying I still know that how the only thing I said I had a problem with, like doing drugs, going, leaving out my leaving from my sister house, you know, because that's that's automatic. Like I wasn't supposed to go outside. Like I left my my sister house and went outside to the wrong environment. I'm saying going by my mom is the wrong environment. I know this now. So you know? let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, Mr. Allen. If if you if you don't get revoked today, I'm not saying whether you will or you won't, but if you don't get revoked today, where do you plan to live? Sounds my like my sister. And what, what makes you think your sister will take you back? Cause she if I, like only reason I was doing the wrong thing. Well, yeah, I know. I, I, rushed, know. I really like to say like. I rushed outside, like I won't put a rush outside. They come with doing 11 years flat. I won't put a rush outside that flat. You know what I mean? Well, 
you know what I'm saying? Then everything out there ain't for you. You hear me? Like, and I know, you hear me? But I'm mean, Joseph and Jill, I know better. Like, I know what the not to do. I know stuff like not to have around me. But you know, you hear me? I know now. You hear me? I ain't. You hear me? Uh, that's all I know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lubin, uh, would you want Mr. Uh, Allen to make a statement uh, before you uh, finish, or uh, how would you like to proceed? Sure. If, if there's a possibility for Mr. Allen to give a statement, and then for me to supplement and give a statement as well, that would be great. All right. Mr. Allen, is there anything you'd like to say to the board before the board listens to Mr. Lubin, and then we make a decision on whether or not we will revoke you today? I can just say I know to do. I know I know the right thing to do. Yeah, and I can really say I really ain't do nothing to do. Like like you really been mad. You know what I mean? Like you know doing all type of stuff. Y'all been in that world moving. You know what I mean? I'm, you know what I mean? All, all I like I say I really ain't do nothing. You know I, mean? I know that I'm really mad. I'm in jail. Like you know I mean? but only thing safe. That I was doing the wrong job. You know? Some I never even you know, that, that I never do. You know? I'm like, man. Mr. Allen, let me ask you a question. Are you are you on any kind of medication? Yeah, right now. Which kind of medication do you take in right now? Oh, uh, like Remember? Were you like, taking Were you taking I, anything before you got revoked? No. Were you prescribed any medication that you might not have been taking while you were revoked? Before yeah. you were, what were you uh, prescribed to take? Uh, I had uh, scripts, like pills, like this. Yeah. What were that? What were the pills for? Do you know? For to keep me like, like up and you know, like normal, like. Yeah, I mean. Why weren't you taking your pills? Because I had. I messed up and went out and went by my mama. You hear me? When I messed up, went over there. Well, before you messed up and went to your mama's house, when you were staying with your sister, were you taking your medication? I was straight, so I went outside. All right. Okay. Mr. Lubin? Thank you, board. Thank you for the time. And, and thanks, Ray, for speaking. So I just want to tie some things together uh, in, in response to the board's questions and to Mr. Allen's answers. Uh, a lot of what I say is going to be in reference to the packet of support that I sent over yesterday. Uh, the reason for that is because the packet of support leads with a release plan that was put together from a client services division worker from my office, Mia Barr, who alongside me has worked quite closely with Mr. Allen, gotten to know him and sort of like the conversation today have been able to assess Mr. Allen's needs to hear from Mr. Allen what exactly he needs for support on the outside and to to diagnose how we got here and how to make sure this doesn't happen again. So you've heard this in Mr. Allen's answers and I think we've heard this in the questions you asked of Mr. Allen, but the primary focus of our release plan is substance use disorder treatment. Uh, the bedrock of that plan is a 28-day inpatient substance use program at LARC, which is, of course, at the border of Louisiana and Arkansas, uh, but also the continued support of me, my office, and Ms. Barr to ensure that once Mr. Allen has completed that program, he has continuing community support to, like Mr. Allen said, make sure that the transition from being incarcerated to being out doesn't end up with him going down the wrong path. You know, Mr. Allen mentioned that he did 11 years flat and then came back on the outside. It's my understanding that Mr. Allen was understandably disoriented, was lacking in supports, the type of supports that my office and his family can give him, and that ultimately things went south. Now, the, the reason that the substance use disorder treatment is also so important to the plan is because we have been back in touch with Rachel Allen, Ray's sister. Rachel Allen is firmly in support of Ray. And like Ray and like us, and I'm assuming like perhaps the board is starting to realize, understands that the breakdown in communication and the breakdown in the housing plan was a result of substance use disorder. And so Rachel has been very clear that upon successful completion of the LARC program, Rachel is more than happy to give Ray a place to stay. Now that's important because 
alongside this being, uh, to my eye, a story about substance use disorder, it's also a story about housing insecurity. The fact of the matter is the criminal charges that we're facing here today, to which Mr. Allen has pled not guilty and which the board noted were refused by the DA's office, ultimately both allegations stem from allegations that Mr. Allen was at his mother's house. And Mr. Allen has said that the only reason he went to his mother's house, which he acknowledges as a mistake, was because he was put out of his sister's house. The common theme here is that Mr. Allen came out after 11 years and didn't have places to go. Now, Mr. Allen is, is ready to admit the mistake of having gone over to his mother's house in the first place, but it's our contention that this stable housing plan and the continued support of our office to ensure that if housing does break down with Rachel, Mr. Allen can be placed in a community setting, in a shelter, or something that avoids any protective order uh, violations is going to be crucial. Uh, also, Mr. Allen and my office have discussed a suite of services such as anger management through CADA's Prevention and Recovery Center, mental health treatment through the START Corps, uh, where he's going to be reevaluated by a psychiatrist. Uh, his needs will be updated and met so that the new prescriptions that he gets are as attentive as possible to his condition. And finally, a referral for Mr. Allen to the Center of Employment Opportunities so that Mr. Allen can start working. Uh, Mr. Allen is only 30 years old. He's eager to obtain a job. He mentioned in his conversation with you all that that's the type of thing he knows he should be doing on the outside so that he's staying out of trouble so that he can pay parole fines and fees so that he can stand on his own two feet and not have to depend on the support of his family to house him. Although that support is, is recognized and valued. And so, in summary, I, I mention all these things because I do believe that the release plan that we've put together for Mr. Allen is directly responsive to his needs. I think it's directly responsive to the allegations here today, both in terms of the failure to pay fees, which Mr. Allen has pled guilty to, and the allegations that stem from the refused uh, prosecution, which Mr. Allen has pled not guilty to. Ultimately, I think the final reason that I believe this support plan will be incredibly helpful for Mr. Allen is keeping in mind the fact that, at least to my understanding, the amount of time left on Mr. Allen's uh, parole is, is quite low. It's not insubstantial, and it will matter a great deal to Mr. Allen, but choosing to convert Mr. Allen's final stretch of parole supervision to the uh, inpatient situation at LARC will functionally amount in the same amount of time that Mr. Allen stays under supervision, but will have the added benefit of giving Mr. Allen the supports he needs to set him up for housing after, to give him the foundations for a healthy relationship with substance use disorder and the ability to understand triggers and to ensure that, like Mr. Allen has said multiple times, he does the right thing doesn't go down the right path. And so in light of all these things, uh, I do ask that the board consider not revoking Mr. Allen's parole and consider uh, the, the submitted uh, release and support packet as a sort of alternative model uh, such that Mr. Allen is allowed to complete 28 days at Lark and then return to Rachel's home where he can get continued community support from her, our office and community partners. And I thank you all for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Lubin. Sure. Mr. Lubin, uh, I think you neglect to take into account that obviously Mr. Allen has some significant cognitive and mental health issues. Not simply a matter of substance use. It's apparent that he has a lot of intellectual um, deficiencies that are not drug related or not related to his drug use. And those things are not going to go away. And so I don't know how realistic it is to assume that all of a sudden, if he goes through substance abuse treatment, that all of the other issues are going to resolve himself and everything's going to live happily ever after. He has some significant intellectual deficiencies, which is going to make employment difficult for Mr. Allen. Also, he has less than a month. Well, actually, a, a month and a day 
before he's off supervision. A month and a day. And I don't even know what the bureaucracy and the paperwork that's involved. Uh, if he would get to walk, uh, and he can't be compelled to stay there after his uh, his supervision has ended on August the twelfth. I mean, I mean, realistically, he's probably not going to get there, you know, soon. And then while he's there, he's no longer going to be on supervision. And there's nothing that's going to, to be an incentive for him to stay there because like say, his, 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 his full term date is August 12th of 2023. Uh, if I may briefly respond to your concerns, I think as to the first concern, uh, I think I and Mr. Allen are in agreement that Mr. Allen's, uh, the obstacles he's facing are not limited to substance use treatment or, and substance use disorder. That is part of the reason that our suite of proposed services for Mr. Allen includes both uh, services at the CADA Prevention and Recovery Center, which is a center that does treat with substance use disorder, but also with behavioral disorders more broadly, anger management services, uh, skills to learn how to cope healthily with your your emotions and to ensure that no matter what your uh, level of development or any sort of disorders you may be facing, that you learn how to have healthy impulse control. But also that uh, we have connected Mr. Allen to Start Core's community health care, because ultimately I think the dilemma for Mr. Allen and for anyone who is just a little bit. I thought you said briefly. Okay, said briefly. then I'll be brief. But just yes. just note that we have referred him to Start Core. He will be evaluated with a psychiatrist there. He will continue his medication management. His medication will be updated. I would just note finally that as you do okay, note, there is only one more question. Let's just say we don't revoke him and he goes to work. Phase 28 days. When he gets out, he will be off supervision. So he is no longer under the umbrella of the services that you all would provide. He, he's free to come and go, do as he chooses or not chooses to do. And so... You know, he was on medication. He had medication before, but he refused to take it, which is not untypical for people like Mr. Allen. I would note that uh, there are a number. The first major difference between now and then is that this time Mr. Allen is leaving incarceration with the support of my office. That is. I guess my point is, how will that support continue? when he is no longer a client in the sense that he no longer is under any form of court supervision. That's, that's, my, that's my question. Yeah, so client services advocates stay on cases for uh, a month to two month grace period after the release of incarceration to ensure that community partners such as START, which aren't tied to one's legal status, get to continue working with Mr. Allen. My final thing I would say for you, because I do understand your concerns about LARC and with these programs in general, but the two incentives that keep Mr. Allen and LARC, first and foremost, are his sister being crystal clear that this is a condition of his staying with her. And second, the fact that Mr. Allen, while he may no longer be on supervision one way or another, does still understand that these are the steps you need to take to live a happy life, but to stay out of jail. Mr. Allen has no interest in continuing a cycle of incarceration. And while parole may no longer be the mechanism that leads to his incarceration if he doesn't follow these steps, he's well aware that the NOPD and other law enforcement agencies will. Mr. Allen is committed to making a change in his life because he doesn't want to keep continuing this cycle. And so that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm ready to vote. Yes. Okay. Ms. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, for me, Mr. Ray, for me, uh, and I'm just one vote, 
My vote is, is to revoke your supervision because of what you have done. Right. And you need to understand, I'm speaking, I'm voting now. You need to understand how to control yourself. You need to, and I think you know that's your mom, that's your mother. And you right. shouldn't be going to her house. Don't speak at this time. Uh, I find you guilty of because of the protective order that was non-expired protective order that was in place that you admit you knew about it. You also admitted that you were using drugs. Uh, so my vote is to revoke your supervision and best wishes to you, sir. Thank and I you. hope you all follow the Orleans plan when you get out. Get their phone number and look them up when you get out. Thank you so much, Ms. Uh, Jackson. Mr. Allen. All I'm going to do, all I'm going to do is yeah. Mr. Allen, we're voting now, sir. Mr. Allen, I find that you have violated the conditions of your uh, parole and my vote. Mr. Allen, you have two votes to revoke. Uh, my vote would likewise be the same. Uh, it might be a little different if you had more time for, to be under supervision, but you don't. You actually have violated your conditions. I find you guilty of both of the charges as well. So. Your probation, your parole has been revoked today. Good luck to you. Mr. Lubin, thank you for your input. I hope when he gets out, he follows uh, the mm -hmm. plan that uh, yes. you have provided for us. Thank you for your consideration. That's painful to watch. Looks like the police dude's talking to him. I don't know what the right answer is in this situation. I've also, he looks so familiar. I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain we covered his initial parole hearing but this was before I was organizing the hearings by inputting the DOC number in the description. And that's what I used to search for, for hearings when I do them. So putting in the search doesn't come up. His attorney also looks familiar. If you uh, happen to know the hearing and can send it to me, or I'll try to find it, but what I'll do is I'll, I'll merge them together into the before and after. So there could be more context, but you know, as Miss Jackson pointed out, I feel I do feel his attorney dropped the ball, not bringing up mental health. I mean, what he brought up, he said this wasn't this is an issue of housing security, and and it's an issue of substance abuse. Um, this is why, and it's like, well, what about it's an issue of mental health? And I don't know who pays his attorney, what program this is under, and who, who you know does everything. But you know, it's quite an interesting hearing. He's like, no, 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 I, I, I haven't done crack, but I've done, I've done other illegal drugs. But it wasn't so. He gets kicked out of his sister's house. Then he shows up to his poor mother's house. Things down the door there. You know, he's out of control. He's obviously he's he's you know, off his meds, he's on illegal narcotics and he gets locked back up. And it's just, I don't know exactly how much more time is left. Is it just a few months? They said, I, so they denied him, but then why did they deny him? He's then going to get out. And, and then what I, 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 then he's basically, basically telling the attorney, well, I hope you provide all the services once he does get out. I, I don't really get it though. It's like, uh, I think what we just saw is the epitome of a broken system. It's like, it seems that he does need mental health help, but what are you going to do? You can't force someone to take their medications. So he doesn't take it. And it creates this cycle of, you know, I thought it was interesting how his attorney was reprimanded. And then he goes on kind of like this broken loop. It felt like about, you know, and then Miss Jackson cuts him off again. I thought he said it was going to be short. And he then even rounds it off by saying, 
his client's not going to go back to prison because he doesn't want to go back to prison. And it's like, dude, yeah, you're not going to convince anyone on that. Of course, he doesn't want to go back, but look where he is. It seems to have kind of like the maturity of a three-year-old. I mean, really. And it's sad because it could be mental health stuff. But I don't know what the answer is here. I really don't. Um, but we've been here for, for now an hour and 40 minutes. We've seen uh, different types of, types of hearings. I uh, thank you for being here. Please do the YouTube uh, thing, and it really helps with the algorithm. And with that, I'll let you go.